Welcome to Watch Your Lips Prep Baseball Canada podcast. My name is Luke Salton and I will be your host. This is the first ever episode or Cam, can you tell me if it really is? The uh, first Watch Your Lips podcast, I think that was what, George 2020? Mm-hmm. I think uh, right when right when COVID happened, we we're just kind of looking for um, some content to be rolling out there. Um, so that kind of disintegrated maybe after six months or so. Um, had some good guests and stuff like that, but uh, it's about time we brought this back. What's so, the really matter? I don't know if disintegrating is the right word. It was more so the legwork that goes into putting a podcast together. Like recording a podcast is easy for us and we were able to do it. But as it grows, there's more time that goes into it. And as the company grew, we just weren't able to dedicate as much time to it. But it was a good idea then. We feel like it's a better idea now just based on our growth. And we're excited to kind of share everything that we do on a platform that everyone can kind of see all at once. Yeah, so obviously myself, I'm new, but there's another face that wasn't on this first um, podcast, and that was Josh Arce. And Arce, kind of introduce yourself. Mm-hmm. So I think you're quite a known person across Ontario here. Um, yeah, you're gonna Josh, make him blush. You're I'm gonna Josh make him Arce. Um, kind of help George and Cam out on uh, with Prep Baseball Canada. So yeah, it's uh, excited to be here. We're just moving forward. I mean, this last weekend, the future games, the trials, um, standouts, who are some people kind of look forward to in the future? Well, just first of all, um, touching on the future games, George, that was probably the best turnout we've ever had for the future game trials. Obviously, with the addition of the senior future games, you kind of add an extra class that we're able to look at there. So um, I believe we have, what, George, probably about 250 between the, the two future game trials and the PO one. Yeah, we're just talking about Ontario, right? So yeah. in Ontario alone, we had two future game trials in the spring, spring one, spring two, as well as PO. And then we added a third that's going to be on May 20th as well. And so between those first three, yeah, we were probably looking at on that first day it was 140 ish. So we're probably we were probably pushing 250 players when all was said and done that have tried out just in Ontario alone. And that doesn't include the junior future games as well. So we could tell that the feedback is there. Obviously, having another team made sense. Having a 25 team was one of the saving graces for Canadians, in my opinion, especially as we adjusted the grad classifications, the reclass situation. And so yeah. that's probably a decent time to get into it. We were going to talk about the grad years. We were going to talk about how that works. And the long story short of it is, yeah, let's just talk about grad years. Like, Cam, you've been there since the beginning. Talk to me about the evolution, in your opinion, of when it started, how it went, and how we're at right now. Like, what do you yeah, think? Yeah, I think when I first started in 2019, you kind of saw those late bloomers reclassing mm-hmm. um, that just physically didn't develop until that grade 12 year. Um, and then I think, obviously, everyone really kind of started to notice it over COVID, right? No one was playing. Everyone needed that extra time. Um, And then it just kind of became a common thing after, um, which is fine. I I think that's a great, great thing for, for a lot of Canadians to, to take that extra year. But um, you know, at the end of the day for us, we just wanted to see kids compared to players at their own age group. We found with the rankings, you know, you had some guys who are a year and a half older than other ones. So just physically, it was kind of tough to compare those guys. Um, and we actually are working on our updated rankings this morning. Um, and it's just fun for us to kind of see where they compare to guys um, their own age. Well, looking back on the reclass situation, I understood, and I've told this to a lot of people, that there was a point in time prior to the current rule changes, prior to the transfer portal, prior to the way that it is now, that it was actually strategic for a Canadian to reclassify, right? Where it made sense for a kid to tell the world that he was taking that extra year because they were stuck in their age. And if I'm a college, I was able to offer that kid if he was in the eighth grade or if he was in the ninth grade. And now that I can't even talk to him, I I don't see the process as being exactly the same. So you say that there's certain players that it it benefits Canadians to reclassify. I agree with that. Just depends on your purpose, right? But baseball can't be the reason why you're deviating from your academic path. If you're trying to tell me that you're a student athlete, that's just facts to me. Right. But if you want to be a ball player, then you're making a business decision as soon as you cross the border. So reclassifying to me, aside from the fact that, and again, one thing that 
parents are beginning to realize and we try and educate them on is when they talk about the birth year and what month their kid is born in, that's not what we're talking about. And the reason they're like that is because tournament rules and tournament companies, when they welcome their players, check the birth dates. But we don't when we travel to the U.S., right? We're only going still, what grade are they in and what's their grad year? Why? Because that's how our whole system transcends itself, right? It's how we rank you. It's how we stack you up. It's how we pick you for teams. And it's how we can actually deliver the truth to colleges when they ask us, not what year are they intending to go to school in, but what grade are they in? And that's why we readjusted the grad classes. And so it has made sense. And now, like you said, it, there's no question of how old a kid is anymore when we look at them. And that's been the ultimate goal. And one day, every kid's grad year on the website is going to be the way it should be. So I think that's a very good point, just kind of touching on that, because when you look at the grad classes, you Mm -hmm. look at the years. If you're a kid who's a certain year and you're up there for maybe top 10, but you get Mm -hmm. pushed off the list for someone that's a reclass, I think that's also kind of adds a factor to it. 100%. Well, that, that is what was happening, right? And we would drop our rankings and then we'd have players messaging us saying, well, I'd like to reclassify. Well, that has nothing to do with college. That has everything to do with the fact that they want to be ranked higher. And that's not a good reason to want to reclassify. Not in my opinion. So and for us, I think it really hit us, George, when we did those first rankings after. Mm-hmm. And there were some guys who for the longest time we were comparing them to kids older than them. So we'd look at it and they might be ranked 21st. And then we're like, wow, you know, they're one of the best 10th graders in the province. So right. I think that's really when it hit us. Yeah. So I like the way that it is. It made life a lot easier. The transition and the understanding has been fairly smooth and now it allows us to pick our teams with a lot more clarity as we go to the best of the West and as we go to Georgia and the West coast games and state games and so forth. So, yeah. How is this process of selecting teams going to be so much different than other years? And can you kind of explain the multiple future games teams and how that's going to work? So this is the first year that prep baseball is bringing a different age group to the future game. So we are going to have three teams total going to Georgia. We're going to have a 2025 team, which is going to be strictly 25s. And then we're going to have a hybrid 26 slash 2027 team. And both those teams are going to be at the elder future games. Then we're going to have a 2028 team that's going to go to the junior future games. So how does it change? We've never been able to pick players that are that old And when I said it was a benefit that we adjusted the grad classes and this was our saving grace, I meant that because strategically speaking, the players that got caught in the middle of a reclass and then the rules switched and then we adjusted the grad years, I do believe that there's a lot of players that reclassified in order to come to the future games. And now that's not the case anymore. They don't have to. So there's players like Shane Brenham, right? Uh, Lefty out of BC, North Shore Twins, who was at the future games last year didn't get the offer he wanted, hasn't committed anywhere. And so if he still hasn't found a spot by the future games, we can bring him again. In years past, those players would have reclassed so that they could have another opportunity. Now they don't have to. So how does it change? We can just stick to the same players over and over again, give them that opportunity that they do deserve. And so if you ask me, this process benefits the Canadians more than anyone because we never committed early when we were able to and now that we're forced to commit later we're probably going to commit the latest and so to have canadians constantly going to a marquee event where they deserve to be there and that's us telling colleges that we believe they deserve a shot has to carry some weight at some point so yeah the way we pick them it's always been the same way we want to pick the best players we don't care who they are where they're from we just want the best players on the field that deserve an opportunity um, we actually look at their GPA when they come to the future games because they know Juco is there for the most part. So if you're coming to the future games, you got to be an NCAA qualifier. If you're not an NCAA qualifier, probably going to struggle to make that team. Um, but other than that, yeah, show up at an event. We think you're good and you deserve a shot. We'll take you. And I think for me, what I'm most excited about with this, I think a lot of people, their first thoughts were, you know, future games or senior future games in those age groups. But this will be the first time ever we're bringing a full team of grade eights to the junior future games. So, you know, they're actually going to be puppies. They're going to be guys we're watching for the next four years. So we're getting them in really a year younger uh, than we did before. And that's always a fun one. You know, obviously 
you know, kids at the future games and the senior future games, they're there to find a school. That's a business trip for them. But the junior future games is just fun, wholesome baseball. So right. looking forward to that one. I think the other cool thing with that, it gives the kids at the junior future games, kids to look up to. This is where I want to build to now. I'm at one point in my baseball career uh-huh. and yeah, it's fun playing these games. But if I want to elevate it for the years down the road, I want to take that next step to try and make the future games. So I think it's a very good um, place for the little younger kids to kind of look up and try and strive and make that dream come true. 100%. It's a pipeline, right? Like you look at those juniors and again, in our world and in our ecosystem, you're at that age where if you're taking baseball seriously enough and you're showing up to our events and your families are investing in you, then you probably do want to get on the map. But we're not trying to sell the fact that you're going to land a full ride at the Junior Future Games because colleges can't talk to you for a long time. But that might be your opportunity to gauge your talent against the rest of the other Canadians across the country, your talent against the Americans that you're going to see for the next few years, really figure out if this is for you. And so you should strive to want to be at the future games if you're at the JFGs. And I have no doubt that those players want to be there. But again, because of those new rules, we could actually have a kid make the JFG team this year, then make the future games next year as a fringe kid, then make that future games team again as a, as a kid at the elder age group, then make the future games again for the fourth time. So they might actually take four trips to Georgia and, That's never happened before for us. So, yeah, patience actually pays off a little bit these days for it. With those calls and selecting the rosters, what goes into what goes into talking about players, narrowing down the list, sending out the invites? Kind of elaborate on that a little bit. I think the biggest thing um, as far as us, you know, we have these events and we kind of put like a short list together of guys who are going to follow moving into May. guys who we kind of will hone in on, um, go out, watch games, see how they perform in game. Um, and by then we kind of, you know, hop on a call like this and kind of just talk about it, who we think um, deserves the opportunity and um, could represent prep baseball Canada um, well down there in Georgia. Um, no, I was just going to say that uh, really – the future game trials, those one indoors, uh, we kind of use that to gauge which guys we need to go out in the summer and see them in game just to confirm, you know, what we saw indoors. Um, obviously, you don't get that gameplay piece of it. Um, so that's kind of how we build out those watch lists um, moving, moving into the summer. So once you send out those invites, what's kind of the process if guys accept that decline? Do you go back to the drawing board? What's that like? Fairly simple, fairly straightforward. We invite a kid. We extend the opportunity. We're not in the business of making decisions for anybody. We'd like to believe that this is, I do believe the Future Games is the best event of its kind in two countries. I really do believe that. And it's been that way for years. And so we're, I'm not in a position and we're not in a position really to convince anybody to have to come to the Future Games. We do extend our invites to the players that we feel deserve it. And if they choose not to come and truthfully, the rate of players that attend the future games after invite is fairly high. And so we don't really think about that whatsoever. We're just very fortunate for the players that want to represent this country and represent the company that we've been trying to build for the last decade, every single year. And those players can all of a sudden, like you said, be the players that the JFGs look up to, right? I, I do believe that JFG players can look up to players that are in high school before they can look up to big leaguers because it's a more realistic short-term goal that is within reach. And so, yeah, we just invite them and we see them in Georgia and if they can come great and if they can't great, but if you're serious about it and that's what you want to do, I'd like to think it's an opportunity to take advantage of. And, and for us here in Canada, we have the benefit of taking anyone from the entire country compared to the U S where they're just bringing, you know, guys from their state. So if yeah. someone says no, it's, you know, we got eight to 10 more guys that are quality players and looking for that opportunity. So I think the other thing is it's you're representing your country. People always kind of look down on Canadian baseball and it gives these kids a chip on their shoulder to go to this event, 
make a name for themselves. And I mean, with the teams the last couple of years, they've been making strides. And just as you guys experiencing that event, what is it like to kind of see the kids making a name for Canada baseball? Arce, what do you think about that? I think it's great. I mean, I've been there the last two years. Um, you know, kind of seeing how it can really just change a guy's career in three games. Like, for example, Brendan Lawson, you know, it's not like he was having it was three doubles a game, right? Like it was a like a hundred what mile an hour line drive off the pitcher's glove, take the pitcher's glove off, hard contact. Good ABs. Good ABs at short. He looked good at short, right? So um some I feel like some some players also forget that aspect of it too. It's not all based off of your results, right? Like it's everything else that comes with it that um, you know, it kind of kind of changed his life, right? Yeah, it ain't and that's the crazy part, right? Is you get to that point. It's funny you say that that they it ain't performance based. See, I don't think that's right, right? It, it just depends what the result you're looking for is, right? Like it wasn't about hits. It was about right. hard hit balls. Right. Right. It, it wasn't about it wasn't about um his ability to get every single out on every single ball that was put in play. It's about his ability to get there and show them that he has the ability to do that going forward. Like we talk about it on the regular. They're teenagers, right? They're te- they're not finished products. They're supposed to be at a point in their development where a college looks at them and thinks, I can do something with that when I see them. And the odds of Think about it. You got five schools there or you got 500 schools there. The odds of one school giving you the opportunity that's going to change your life, that is what you should be looking for. And that is what Lawson did, right? That's what a lot of players did where, again, I'm a firm believer that ain't nobody gone to the future games and it ended their career, but there's a lot of players that went to future games and it changed their lives forever. And that's how I see it. So, yeah, you're right. It ain't stats-based. It's... And I think, I think Jordan Jacob is a great example of that. Mm, you know, yeah. he was down there this year and it's not like he was, you know, going two for three every game, you know, with a home run or, but he had a great workout day. He showed off his tools. Yep. We put him in the outfield for a couple innings and, and, you know, showed that versatility as well. So he didn't put up a great tournament stat wise, I would say, but we left there and a lot of college coaches were asking us about him. So I think mm-hmm. that's one of the tournaments where you're going there to show your tools Um, You know, you're not trying to bond or move runners over or, you know, you you know, you'd rather go oh for three with three hard hit balls than, you know, about Tim Piacentin. Yeah, Yeah. just going to say the same thing about Tim Piacentin, who came out of nowhere and then committed to Miami. I don't really know. T12, too. That was uh, that was massive. I don't know if we've ever had a Canadian commit to Miami, at least at a high school. I don't think so. Not off the top of my head that I can remember. And this was a kid that essentially came out of the dust and was from BC and he landed at Okotoks and there were some good swings we saw on social media and we're like, Oh, that's all right. And ended up being better than all right. And a lot of people felt the same way. And so it, that's the cool feeling, right? That's the validating feeling of, I have a hard time believing he would have committed to Miami had he not gone to the future games. I really have a hard time believing that. And that's not a knock on where he comes from, but where he comes from is where the development ensures that he's going to be prepared to go to Miami. And in many cases, those programs are also the ones that can give them more opportunity. The dogs get in front of more than enough people so that D ones know who they are. But maybe this one opportunity was just like teams don't go to the future games. Players do. Right. Yeah. And if your player goes now, it's like more people know who the dogs are and more people know yeah. who Tim Piacentin is. Now Canadians know what Miami is. And I just thought the whole situation was really cool for him. And he happens to be just an awesome kid. And so you're right. The timing couldn't have been better. The process for him couldn't have been better. Um, and he wasn't a kid that started as a JFG kid. He is a kid that blossomed in high school. We got eyes on him at the right time, invited him to the right event. And he was able to make it. And I don't remember him studying it out on the field. I just remember him starting it out every time he walked onto the field and people just wanted to see what he was going to do. And that was enough. So I'm happy. For I him. think the other thing is for kids at those events, like Cam, you kind of touched on earlier, the other teams at the future games are playing for your state as a player's perspective, playing for the country. You're meeting kids 
that you never even heard of before. That's pretty cool for them. Go to event, just connect and learn how to play with a new style of ball players. Because speaking from someone who transitioned from Prince Edward Island all the way over to Ontario, the style of the game is so much more different. And I don't think a lot of people know that. So to have all these kids come together from so many different provinces, I think it was really cool to see. That's the cool thing for us with the future games. Obviously, you know, I said it earlier, but just bringing kids from across the country. But really, I mean, other than Team Canada, um, Blue Jays Academy stuff, there's really not many moments where kids from all over the country, from coast to coast, are all on the same team. So that's a unique piece for us with this one. Kind of moving into the best of the West, an event that is up and coming. I mean, what does there look forward to? I mean, the rosters are pretty much full now. And I mean, it's something that I think everyone can look forward to. And I see this team showing up and doing great. Yeah. Yeah. The best of the West. I'm best fired West up. People. Part of me. I'm fired up. Yeah. We're fired up. I, yeah. I can't wait to get to BC. It is. So I played in the best of the West when I was in high school for the North Shore Twins. And so I have that little part of my heart that loves the best of the West for a different reason. And I remember when we went out there as a staff to cover it a couple of years ago, it almost felt like Kemal and I were talking and it felt like such a no brainer to see if we could get a team in there. And Marty Lane, who I got to give Marty all the credit in the world for giving us the opportunity to be in the best of the West. I mean, the platform to have, I believe the best of the West, the best high school club tournament in the country. And so to have a select team that has East coast representation is very cool, right? Where I, we know, so the tigers, we ran our qualifier tigers is going to be the Ontario bid. And then we have our prep baseball team at 18 U. and last year was our first year. This year we have a 15 new team as well. And so to have an RC is actually managing that team of 15 U. we expect them to do really well. Oh um, boys. Yeah. So it's, the mock puppies, but we're working on the name. So to have a 15 and 18 year team that we have historically only been able to send to the U S to the future games or junior future games. And now to be able to send a quality of players from all over Canada to a tournament within Canada, I think that's pretty special and unique in itself because there's actually a trophy at the end. And so we don't have bunt defenses. Uh, we don't have cut plays. So if we do found well, that out last year, yeah, we found that out last year. Like, you can get torched in, against club teams when they know exactly what they're doing, and we're just saying, hey, we've got smaller fields, wood bats, uh, time change. RSA might be jet-lagged and just might send the runner at the wrong time. But I just – I also told them that I envision being our 50 new teams' biggest fan when they're playing. I can't wait to watch them play because I hope that they're going to want to be with us the next year at the 18U. And we'll be there. JG LaRock is going to be with yep. us in the dugout as well. So we're excited to have him. I think he's one of the best humans in the country and 100%. what he's going to bring to the table for the players, for our staff and what we learned from him on the regular, that's going to reverberate through the culture we're trying to provide. So I think I, the other thing with JG, sorry to kind of cut in, but good. with the mental side of the game, he provides something that a lot of these kids have never kind of heard before so he can bring a perspective that's really going to teach these kids a lot and it's going to really help them as they transition into um, college up their competition they're never going to forget the things that he tells them i agree with that he's got to be one of the more forward thinking coaches that can identify with a wide range of players so he can communicate with players he can communicate with coaches just a very cool down-to-earth person who has done more for baseball Sudbury than anybody as far as I can remember and only he could tell me if there's anybody that's done more and he's probably too humble uh to say it anyway and Canada so Cup champion yeah like two-time Canada Cup champ back-to-back like the fact that there's a storyline with Ontario now going for a three-peat at the Canada Cup brings a lot of a lot more relevance to the Canada Cup as well, where it's like it, it is a quality tournament. It is back, and you need people like JG to really push that forward or Greg Bronze and Sask, et cetera. That's just the way it works. And so when you got people like that and you put quality players or any player really around people like that, it has to enhance their opportunity in this game because 
it is a very brutal game. It is very tough. It is very difficult. I mean, you got people like JG that can really slow it down for you and have you enjoy. JG is the type of kid that can make a player enjoy being in the moment in BC when they're struggling mightily way more than they could have imagined. And he can just bring them back down to earth and be like, remember that you're just in BC playing baseball and it's a lot of fun. Um, and I think a lot of players need to hear that. So, yeah, I could go on forever about him, but we're thrilled. I was going to say, it's really the only chance before this, everything we did was showcase based. We wanted a kid to come out to a showcase, showcase their tools. But now, I mean, we're playing for a real championship, you know, like last year we got to play against the Okotoks dogs, one of the premier programs in the country. Um, so to have, you know, a PBR logo playing against some of these club programs is really cool. And to boot, I mean, you're playing in the mountains in the middle of British Columbia. Um, so that's an awesome piece. Let's kind of get into the teams a little bit, George. You want to give me a little breakdown of the 18U squad led by JG? Yeah, so we're more or less full out there. Potential to add a couple arms, but we'll start off in the infield. So behind the play, we got Nathan Flewelling. We've got Zaretsky, Dylan Zaretsky from Timo, who may see some time over there, but it's probably going to be more at first base, we picked up Maxime Descari out of the Reds Academy. So defensively, I think, dude, I think Descari is way more advanced defensively than a lot of the catchers we saw. And so I'm just excited to see what that really looks like in compete mode. Um, but Quebec has a history of quality catchers. So banking on that. And then backing them up is Gabe LaRock. So one of the puppies on the team where he can pretty much do anything and catch by the outfield pitch. Um, and I just have a feeling he'll do all right at the dish when he gets his opportunity. So around the diamond, we've got Alex Disopolis at third base. We've got Tristan DeRoche at short. We got Cam Gravel at second. And I actually feel like we've got three shortstops right there that are just going to shuffle around the place. Like and ta yeah, Tess might pitch a little bit as well. So we'll see how that goes. But if he doesn't and he's just full-time infield, cool. Um, we've got two left-handed bats out of those three. Um, they can move, they can play, they got arm strength. And then at first base, like I said, we're either going to have a Flewelling, a Decari, um, a Zaretsky, who I think will probably have the most time over there. Arce put it best with Zaretsky. He he told me, like, the big thing for him was the bat and the body for now, right? Catching's a very difficult position, and I do believe he's got the build to get there. But as of today, it's the bat and the body. And Arce said it very eloquently where he said he flicks his wrist and it's off the wall, and I would agree with that. So in a wood bat tournament, I can see that really playing up because it does carry a little bit out there. So in the outfield, we are going to have Nathan Roy out of Canada Reds Academy, Emilio Saavedra as well out of the Reds Academy. And we are also going to round out the outfield with Trenton Cui, who is going to be an underage Sask boy. Yeah, a little Sask boy as well. And so realistically, we're looking at the whole order. Um, we're not going to have a ton of position players because if they're there, we trust them. Right. Like we want them to compete. Um, we want them to get on the field. And if we think they're good, then they're going to get their reps. And so you can only have one catcher. And so the other guy is going to be available. Uh, someone's going to be the DH and we're going to make sure these guys get their reps in the outfield. And then on the mound, I actually feel pretty confident. We've got in Gelhard out of Timo. We've got Nick Halkovich out of the Titans. We've got Lucas McDowell out of the Reds. Samuel Lozon out of the Reds as well. Um, picked up Luke Hatcher from Newfoundland out of PSA. Yep. And so shout out to yep. Sweeney and those boys. And so we're pumped about Hatcher. Um, it just, again, you, you talk about the development stages of a player. Like if, if Hatcher is even remotely close to what everybody else is in BC, that should speak volumes to what they're doing out there in Newfoundland. That's my opinion, right? Because you're not going to have the volume based on the per capita, based on what they've got. And if they can, pull out another Hudson White, right? Or something similar to that from the right side. I find that to be extremely impressive. And so we are going to have Hatcher with us. Um, and then we're also going to have Willis Samare from Saskatchewan. So he may get some time in the field, but a little bit of a sleeper for us as well as Lucas Kaufman, who's a lefty from Saskatchewan as well. Um, rounding out on the mound, we've also got Aiden Harhold, who's going to be out of Canada Reds Academy. Uh, we're going to have Julian Robertson out of Timo, who's going to be out there as well. And then we are finishing that off with, who am I missing here? Uh, one guy just off the top of my head, Matt Murray. Our, uh, our I guy feel like I need to, year. I got to give Matt Murray way more love, man. Like Matt Murray is. 
He was our best player. He jumped onto the, the scene last tournament. Yeah, he was our best player last year. Balled so out. Jason Chatwood recommended him to us out of Sylvan Lake um, in St. Joe's Academy and was just adamant that this dude was a baller. And when he showed up, he was exactly that. He played every position. I remember Perfect. when he was in the left, he made a play, and I think he hosed a guy, ran yep. in, and was like, I've never played left field in my life. And we were like, that's awesome. He's just a good ball player. I think he led our team in hits. And so, yeah, I did miss him. He'll be back with us, though. And so, no, nah, we're – I feel pretty geared up at the 18U level. Um, I, I'm pumped with what we've got. I think that when we sit there and think – of the quality of player that we were looking for to bring with us. I feel like that roster already got stronger within a year. And so uh, I love what we're looking at. We also added late, sorry, J Jordan Doyette from Can Academy Reds. Um, and we added Jordan Taylor as well from the HPP Tigers. And so we're looking forward to the roster that we've got. We're pumped to, compete in bc i told marty we would compete against those guys and so yeah our... real, i mean pretty much every one of those kids came out to a showcase over the past six months and balled out and showed us what they are capable of and, and earned an invite from that ultimately so to the west was it's at that time of year where we weren't going to wait for them it's at the beginning of may the season starts at the beginning of may so we had to pick a team before they got outside. And so it really was about what we knew, what we saw and what you did, right? Where Halkovich has to be the best example where he was on the radar last year. I'm not going to say he was a total unknown, um, but Natal Hua was a total unknown yep. uh, to me, at they least to our used. staff. And so these guys show up and we can give them an opportunity, yep. right? We can actually give them an opportunity in front of people that can really change their lives. And yeah, we, we do pick them from our events. Yeah, so George, for the first time this year, um, unlike last year, you're sending a 15U team. Ars is going to be um, coaching that. Kind of touch on that and the roster that uh, Canadians can look forward to watching. So, uh, no, we're, we're looking at a smaller roster of players that, again, it's a pipeline where it's a 15U team where we're looking to identify players for the super sophomore right for the junior future games because we do have one 2028 20, as well there um western merit and so to kind of get into those players yeah we went with um a younger group of players that we felt was quality and i think we're very good i mean we got brett crowley from the terriers and lincoln rose from the Terriers. so they're two quality guys in the sense of rose can pitch play the infield do a little bit of everything but just the body the length he's looks right and then you got Crowley who's right next to him and he's big he's physical and I remember seeing him hit at the future game trials and thinking like that's gonna play and then you see him on the mound and it just looks right it's a lot of strikes um and it's already low eights for a kid that's gonna be pounding the zone with a couple pitches from a shorter distance and so that's what we got out of the Terriers elsewhere in Ontario we've got Nicholas Emans we've got Weston Merritt who's the puppy on the team and who is also the OBA player of the year last year. And so Weston's going to be able to do a little bit of everything for us. He was the last addition to this team. Emans is going to play some outfield as well as pitch again, left on left. Um, the arm just gets to the right spot and works quick. Doesn't stop, but should just be uncomfortable for everyone. Um, and then elsewhere from Ontario, we've got Colin Miller, who's going to be behind the plate, big physical lefty bat. He might put a ball on the moon on that field. So I'm pumped for it. We got Jaden Simpson who I'm very pumped about left on yep. left. Could start in center, start on the mound. Good little swing. Awesome. Most kid. viewed profile on the website over the past week. Cool. Uh, yeah, that doesn't surprise me. That kid just, it looks right. Everything he does. And he's at that age where you talk about 15, you like, you don't expect him to be six feet tall yet. He's expected to be uh, a smaller, skinnier kid, but I thought his 60 was wrong based on the fact that a kid that size shouldn't be able to run that fast at that age and he does he's just a very athletically gifted kid and so we're pumped to have Jaden. and then rounding out in ontario we've got joe van wang as well from the tigers and so he's going to play some infield i like it on the mound um and then we'll see what he does at the plate as well and so elsewhere we've got ben kent from newfoundland and so yep. benny is a huge left-handed bat might play some yeah. first i don't know where he's gonna end up he's just so big and physical but we're excited to just see what he can do and might be able to pitch a little bit too. And we saw him, he was at red scout day. And so we were able to get a look at him and looks right, man, that age. Um, I also forgot to mention, we got Tyler Scott from the Nats. So Scott is 
a kid who's probably going to catch a little bit for us, might play some infield. We need guys to move around. I liken him to Tyler DePros from Alberta, where we're going to be able to move him around a little bit as well. And so in a tournament format, you just need a couple guys that can do that. And Weston Merritt is the third who can just pretty much play any position on the field. Um, and so we're excited to have him. But then otherwise, we're finishing it off with Thomas Hill, a big lefty from Alberta. Um, and Jack Stevens, who's just a very clean looking righty 2027 out of Alberta as well. And so that team, like you said, is going to be managed by Arce, by Phil. It starts the day after the 18 U best of the West and they play the 9 a.m. game, the first game by themselves. And so I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to seeing them compete. Um, there's rumblings that we may have a 13 U team as well there next year. And so I love the best of the West. Halton, I think it's the most fun. I think a trip to BC, yeah. like Cam said, to compete against the best Canadians. Um, at that time of year, it feels like a kickoff for everything. So can't wait. I think the thing about the 15 U2, you're mm -hmm. looking at kids who have potential to play in this next Canada games. That's something that's really cool. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Ben Kent. <clears throat> he was down in Florida with uh, Newfoundland in their trout for their Canada Games team. That opened up the door for him. He's going mm -hmm. down to TNXL. I think there's a lot of good kids on that Best of the West team that have potential to crack a couple Canada Game rosters. So I think to kind of get the early preview, I mean, that's good to see. And, I mean, it's really cool. Get the kids early, watch them develop, and see where they potentially go and play college baseball. Yeah, man. And we, we want to see them compete early. And that's always been our biggest thing is we're not going to invite anybody to something that we don't think makes sense for them to compete early in, right? Like, we sit there. Like, I understand when we're talking about the Super 60 and the time of year for Canadian pitchers. Like, yeah, like, I'm not going to – my heart's not broken if Canadian arms don't want to go because I do understand the time of year. Right. And so at this time of year, these guys want to compete. Pro guys are there. National team guys are there. Our staff is there. The dogs are there. Vauxhall's there. The Blaze are there. Um, all the best teams from Western Canada are there. And it's an, like Camp said, an actual tournament. No track man, no screen behind home plate. And it's wood bat, something that we don't do a ton of in Ontario anymore. And so to go out there with wood bat, yeah, it might also be an expensive weekend without you noticing. So I don't have enough to say about the best of the West, but the pipeline for us to be able to identify players early for the rest of the country to identify players early, they might go out there and somebody else might change their life for all we know. Yeah. So. And the the big thing with that too, with that 15U team, obviously 27s are eligible for the future games this year, but next year that team is going to be predominantly 2027s. And we get the chance to watch about 13, 14 of them for four straight days in game action. So nice to see those guys early. I remember at my first prep baseball report event, George, you spoke and you just said how, I mean, if you're a kid who still has four years till they're going off to college, we're going to watch you grow and develop. So don't compare yourself to older kids at events. And I think that's something super important with these younger kids as they just kind of trust their process, go out and have fun in a real tournament out of the showcase setting, it's going to be super neat to see. Just baseball. Just go play, and your career becomes way more difficult when you compare yourself to way more people that you shouldn't be. So. Zach Eady, he was at a prep baseball event in 2017, sat 74, 76. <laughs> He's dominating the March Madness. Guys, I'm going to... Throw a tongue twister at you. Josh Arce in his prime versus Zach Eady. Three at-bats. What's the result? Like I'm either going to slight Arce with this or I'm going to slight a guy who might win a national championship tonight. So uh, that that's a tough question. Why don't you hit him with it, George? I ain't answer. I don't, I don't know, man. If you're you going based off the I used Twitter, to eat up 74, 76. Back you eat up 74, 76? I, I could eat up 74, 76. Yeah, but from that, it off release the Twitter comments. Releasing it at your face, dude. What you mean? I don't think you get, I don't think you hit him. It, I, right now, if you gave me three ABs, I think I could barrel at least one. Regardless, on Edie, um, the Instagrams blew up. So I didn't go to the JFG trials on Monday. I was at home working away on the computer. And just something came through. It was like bar stool. And they're like, hey, can we use this video? 
I didn't even know that video existed on Twitter. So when they asked me, I was freaking out and I was like, I'm not letting Barstool steal all these, you know, likes and all this engagement. So I had to quickly sit there and, and work with it and get that up online. But it was pretty cool yeah. by the end of it. Um, obviously, I think we had Bleacher Report. It was on March Badness, Purdue. Um, and MLB. then obviously we were at that showcase. We were at the Future Game Trials on Saturday. Um, and I was sitting there trying to get a guy up on Instagram. And it was like, uh, MLB has just tagged you in a video. And then I was uh, obviously running around showing everybody. I was pretty fired up. Um, so that, that was a cool week uh, for our accounts. Definitely um, the most viral we've ever gone in my five or six years. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. That was episode one of the Reincarnated Watch Your Lips podcast. We'll see you next time.